So we're excited to welcome you to Gettysburg College. And once again, congratulations to the class of 2025. Um, I'm Gail Sweezy, Dean of Admissions. And thank you for joining tonight's science um, research panel. Um, our accomplished faculty and students will share a bit about the science research program here at Gettysburg, which is really a distinctive feature. And they'll also answer your questions. We will be using the Q&A feature, just so, so you know. Um, and please also note that this session is being recorded. So now it's my pleasure to turn this over to Darren Glass, Professor of Mathematics and Dean of the Sciences. Thank you, Dean Zuzi. Uh, welcome to all of you. And again, congratulations to all of you for becoming members of the Gettysburg family or being invited to be members of the Gettysburg family. We're really excited. Um, today, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about just what sciences are like at Gettysburg College and studying it and then turn it over to Professor Fry. And really, the, the stars of our show are a few of our students who are going to talk about some of their experiences doing science research here at Gettysburg College. So do you want to advance the next slide? So when we talk about STEM or sciences at Gettysburg College, we have programs in a wide range of fields. We're really talking about a, a, a large range of topics. As I list here, you can look at astronomy, biology, biochemistry and molecular biology, which is what we often call BMB, uh, BMB, chemistry, computer science. We have a new data science minor that's becoming very popular. Uh, which sort of mixes computer science, math, physics, economics, and a number of other areas. Uh, we have a very robust environmental studies program that looks at both sort of the scientific parts of environmental studies, as well as some of the more humanistic and social science part of the environment. We have a health sciences program, which um, is really, you can think of it as sort of a human biology or a yeah, human biology department. Um, and there's a track within there that's really focused on sort of a pre-med or pre-health, a lot of pre-nursing and physical therapy students and that type of thing. There's also, of course, in this day and age, a lot of interest in public health. And we have a number of courses and a few faculty who study uh, public health and epidemiology. Um, as Dean Sweezy mentioned, I'm a mathematician. We have, we have a great math department that I'd love to talk about. We have a neuroscience department that bridges biology and psychology or a program, a minor. Uh, we have physics and we have a large psychology department. On top of all of this, we have a dual degree engineering program that allows students that are interested to spend three years here at Gettysburg and then go and spend the last, spend two more years at Columbia University, Washington University at St. Louis. There's a few other of these engineering programs and end with an engineering degree in addition to their bachelors of, uh, from Gettysburg. One of the things I think makes studying science at a liberal arts college a little different and I think really special uh, compared to a certain research universities is the interdisciplinarity and the interdisciplinary courses. I've already alluded to some of our programs that do this, but even within individual departments, there's often a number of, of courses uh, professor Fry teaches, co-teaches with a physics professor um, a course in biophysics and, um, and things that I don't understand. Um, I've taught with a computer scientist and we do we have that link. We have a lot we have a biologist and a computer scientist to teach an infor bioinformatics course. Um, so there's a lot of these interdisciplinary things even within the sciences and that's even before you get to the campus at a more large. Shelly, if you want to advance the slide? Um, our, our graduates, our science graduates, and our other graduates are very successful. Uh, just a couple of little statistics that sort of show that. Uh, we Each year, the, uh, our career engagement office does a one-year out survey, looking at what the alumni are doing one year after graduation. And last year, when they looked at the class of 2019, 100% of the science majors were either employed or attending graduate school. Um, and employed in a field that they were interested in. And sort of, I think I forget exactly how we phrased that question. I'll say Gettysburg College as a whole, the number is in the mid 90s. So this, the, the sciences are a little better, but, um, but you know, Gettysburg College as a whole, our alums tend to do very well. Um, over a decade span, this is the most recent data I could find. We have 139 
Gettysburg graduates uh, who completed PhDs between 2006 and 2017, PhDs in science fields, science and engineering. Um, we also offer a lot of different uh, a lot of different ways that students can explore sciences outside of their coursework. I mentioned here the STEM house, which is a way that students can often live together focused on STEM. And we also have a number of student organizations. I mentioned STEMinists here, which is a, a group that looks at women in the sciences. And I started to list more and then just got overwhelmed by, you know, I could list every department, every major just about has an honor society, a club of some sort, a pre-health group, uh, the pre-veterinary group, um, you know, all types of them. So I sort of got overwhelmed and only listed the one. Um, but there's a number of ways that we sort of try to connect our students in, who have a science interest to each other and to you know, faculty, because the faculty participate in a lot of these things. Uh, oh, I mentioned the STEM house. I guess that bullet point carried over as well as the science organizations. Um, we also do offer a lot of first year seminars. Our first year seminar program is one that I used to be very involved in um, before I was Dean. And so I, I have to brag about it. And a number of these first year seminars, as you've seen, are related to the sciences. Uh, just this coming fall, we have one on from the earth to the moon about the space race, one about a dying ocean, looking at sort of ocean life. Einstein in Wonderland looks at quantum physics. That's actually taught by a philosophy professor. Um, and then we have a physics professor who teaches one on science fiction and science fact, looking at sort of your favorite aspects of science fiction movies and asking, are these actually plausible? And what would these actually mean? Um, there's a number of other ones that the environmental studies department offers one about forestry uh, and another one about the relationships between humans and animals. Um, you know, I, I'm offering one on the history of, and philosophy of probability theory. So this is, I think, a nice way of taking a course that's sciencey in your first semester at Gettysburg, but isn't like a, a, a traditional intro to chemistry, intro to physics type of course. Um, I also want to mention, because Gettysburg has a lot of unique things, our science program is very strong, but we have a lot of other strengths, many of which connect to the sciences. So I wanted to just highlight, you know, we have this Eisenhower Institute for Public Policy, but of course, public policy, to really think about public policy these days, so many of the issues connect with the sciences. Um, we, so we have, you know, they often have programming related to policy, related to global, uh, global warming and climate change. Uh, public health, of course, I already mentioned that it has a lot of public policy connections. Um, actually, tomorrow night, there's a lecture that they're hosting about debris in space that includes like the person from the Commerce Department who's in charge of space debris. Um, and so I think our Eisenhower Institute really tries to connect across campus, including to STEM fields that you might not otherwise think of. And then one other gem of the college that I have to mention is our Center for Public Service. Our students have lots of opportunities to get involved in the greater community, both, both locally and on, regionally. Uh, we have a farm on campus that our environmental studies department helps to run. Um, we, you know, there's a number of other opportunities for stu you know, students. A, a lot of this has to do with science outreach. Um, students getting in and working with, there's a group that works with middle school girls doing Lego robots. Um, another group that goes in and takes students on field trips out into various natural preserves in the area. Um, so our STEM disciplines, I think, are really robust within the classroom, and I'm happy to talk more about that if you have questions in the Q&A box, um, and also outside of the classroom. And then, of course, the biggest piece of this, and I think one of the things that does really make Gettysburg studying science here special is, and the reason you're all here really, is this is the opportunities to do research with faculty across, you know, across campus and across the science disciplines. Um, and that can take a variety of forms, both during the semester and over the summer. And one of the crown jewels of sort of this program is what we call the XSIG program. And I will turn it over to Dr. Fry, who in addition, to being a chemist runs this program and does a wonderful job. So Professor Fry, take it away. All right, thank you, Darren. So just to introduce myself, um, I'm Shelley Fry. Uh, in terms of the hats that I wear at the college, I am in the, a professor in the chemistry department. I chair biochemistry and molecular biology. So that's BMD. As Gail pointed out, there are 
many acronyms that we'll be introducing you to. Um, and I'm also the coordinator of this Cross Disciplinary Science Institute at Gettysburg College, or XSIG, um, as, as we call it here. Um, XSIG uh, came about in 2012. I like to say it was born in 2012 because I literally, we literally found out about the funding that started XSIG, which was um, about a one and a half million dollar Howard Hughes grant um, when I was about to have my first child who's about to turn nine. So I like to say that she's grown up along with XSIG on this campus. Um, and so in 2012, we received this grant um, across the divisions of, of the sciences. And what was really the thread and what we wanted to do, and we were already doing these things, but we wanted to do it a bit more systematically, is to help our students be research ready, research active, and research connected through a series of initiatives. And the majority of the initiatives that I'm going to be talking about today came out of that grant and have now been sustained by the college as the grant ran out after five years. Um, and so, some of the examples of things that XSIG does is, just as Darren pointed out, we um, sponsor many interdisciplinary courses. So he mentioned um, the biophysics class that I te teach with Professor Kurt Andreessen. So I'm in the chemistry department and he's in the physics department. Um, we also teach a really cool lab-based class, which is called Salty and Fatty, where we um, look at things like um, salts and fats and DNA and how they interrelate with one another um, in a lab only class. So this is two afternoons a week where our students come in um, and they're literally doing independent research throughout the course of the semester. Um, and what's great about that class is this a 300 level class where we have chemists, biologists and physicists working side by side in the lab, which is a pretty unusual um, for a 300 level science class. In addition, we have a lot of um, new research-based course experiences. Um, and so these are where, when the students have lab, they're actually doing novel research through the course of their lab. So an example of that is one of our sophomore level classes in genetics. Um, one of our professors, so this is Professor Jennifer Powell, brought in um, some of her, she does, um, on a model system called C. elegans. These are, these are small nematode worms, and the students actually do novel experiments on these um, worms throughout the semester. Um, and so it's not them coming in and following a protocol like one normally um, would think of that they were doing in an undergraduate research experience, but they're actually um, doing independent uh, projects. Um, XSIG also funds independent research, as we'll talk about um, on, on our next slide. They support student travel to academic conferences. So, of course, I have to include a snapshot of two of our recent students from Professor De La Salle's group on the bottom um, presenting their independent research at a conference. We have a very cool cross-disciplinary seminar series where um, people are invited in to give uh, research seminars, but one of the criteria in order for them to be invited is that they also have to give a general lecture. And the general general lecture actually has to reach across multiple disciplines. So some of my favorites are when we had a mathematician who came in and spoke about circadian rhythms. We've had people who are in environmental studies um, that spoke about uh, climate change. And then we've also had chemists who spoke about art and art uh, restoration. Um, and also through XSIG was where STEM House was born, uh, as Darren mentioned. Um, in terms of kind of the, the thing that I think most of us get the most excited about um, is our summer research program. So our XSIG summer research, um, the photo in the upper left is a photo of the last time we had an in-person summer research program. So that was two summers ago. So that was 2019. Um, that summer we had about 65 students and this is across the entire division. So there were mathematicians and chemists and biologists and we were all um, working together through this summer research program. Um, these are eight week experiences for students. Um, what's fantastic about them is they're full time. So this is approximately 40 hours a week that the students are working on their research projects. It includes a stipend um, so that they don't have to have a job on the side as well as free housing. Um, and these students are working alongside faculty and doing um, true student faculty research. You can see a picture up there of Zeke in the upper right where he's actually um, working on the particle accelerator that hangs out in our physics department. What makes our summer research program um, slightly unique compared to some of the other ones that I'm familiar with is not only do we have um, students working in the lab and in the field and at the blackboard or whichever um, thing you're doing or on the computer that they're doing for the research, but we also have programming outside the lab. And so one of kind of the, the 
the cornerstones of this is the picture on the bottom, which is what we call our, our brown bag lunches. And so every Tuesday we have a brown bag lunch where we have people from different groups uh, assigned to tables. So for instance, you'll have a physicist sitting at a table with a biologist. And so remembering that the physicist may not have had biology since high school, and the biologist may not have seen physics for several years, is the idea is that we are having our students explain their research to one another. So they're working on not only building a community through this and getting outside of their own research group, but also working on communication skills. Um, one of the other things that we do, which is cool, which you can see the link to, um, on the slide is we have a blog and each group contributes to the blog. Some people write about their experiences of living in Gettysburg over the summer, while others get into the nitty gritty of the types of research that they do. So I, I encourage you to check that, uh, that blog out um, to, to read a little bit more about the research. To be a bit more general with research experiences, I just kind of wanted to point out um, that independent research with faculty is not only happening during the summer, but it's also happening during the academic year. Um, and so this is kind of our general advice slide that I usually uh, show where we kind of point out that you can join a research team. These research teams are not just in you know, two or three departments, but they're in all departments and programs across our division. So everything um, that Darren pointed out and in the first slide, there is research going on between students and faculty in all of those departments. Many of our students present their research at conferences, and so these are students who are going to national conferences and giving posters, and some of them are even giving talks at these conferences, which is amazing. Publishing their research, we've had, in fact, one of our students in just a moment will be talking about um, some of her independent research that she did in the physics department, where she actually published her research, I think, either as a sophomore and early in her junior year. Um, and we often like to say that doing independent research is not just necessarily preparing you for a career in research, of course it does that, but we also have many students that are going on to medicine and teaching and consulting and finance, um, with the idea being that it's not just about the actual research that you're doing, but it's about the problem solving and the hands-on experiences that you're having um, within that with the lab. And so with that, I want to stop so that way we have plenty of time for our three students um, that are joining us today. Um, and the first one is uh, Jordan Markle. So she actually is um, a research student in my lab and she'll be telling you a little bit about her experiences here at Gettysburg. Hi everyone, my name is Jordan and I'm a junior biochemistry and molecular biology major with a studio art minor. I chose Gettysburg primarily because of its science center and the research opportunities afforded to students, and I've been really happy with my decision. I got involved in research immediately during the fall semester of my first year. I was selected to be part of a class called Introduction to Phage Biology, which included a course-based research experience in addition to the normal introductory biology curriculum. We got to isolate and characterize the Nawa bacteria phage, which are viruses that attack bacteria. I really enjoyed my experience in that class, and it cemented for me that research is my path. In these photos, my class is celebrating the fact that everyone just successfully isolated their phage. And in the other photo, I am showing off the 24 Petri dishes that I just prepared. And then in the uh, spring semester, I applied for the XSIG summer program and I was selected to join the Fry Lab where we researched the interactions between proteins and cell membranes. Getting to spend the summer between my first year and my sophomore year working in a lab full time was an extremely valuable experience. I learned so much and had a lot of fun doing it and have continued my research in the Fry Lab for the past two years now. I'm currently preparing for my third summer of XSIG and uh, my research through XSIG and through the uh, semesters I've spent in the Fry Lab uh, helped me to win an American Chemical Society Award, which gave me the opportunity to present my work verbally at the ACS National Conference. It was truly an amazing experience to have as only an undergraduate. The XSIG program is really great and I can't speak highly enough of it. Um, I got to bond with other chemistry, BMB and bio students, and I really got to know my professors to a much closer level. Um, in these photos, the upper right, I'm operating the uh, DLS, which is an instrument uh, that allows me to measure the size of tiny vesicles that I just made. Um, the lower photos are just some fun from XSIG. Um, on the left, uh, is an image of me and my uh, 2019 summer lab group. And the right photo is from the XSIG hike. So again, that's just kind of what how Dr. Fry emphasized earlier on that there, it's a lot more beyond just research. You really get to foster those connections. Um, summer 2020 was actually virtual XSIG. So I don't have a ton of photos from that, but uh, it's looking like we'll have a on-campus research program this summer. So that's very exciting. 
Um, research is just a very large part of my Gettysburg career. The genetics course that you take as a BMB or bio major also has a large independent research component, um, as does biochemistry too. I'm also currently taking X lab, uh, which Dr. Fry mentioned a little bit earlier as well. Uh, that class is a cross disciplinary lab only course that involves chemistry, biology and physics. Um, and I'm working on a novel research project there, which is really interesting. Um, Gettysburg College's biology and chemistry departments are really great at getting students involved in a variety of different ways. All of the professors are really open and friendly to talk to about their research. And if that's something you want to get involved to get involved in, you can do so straight away, both in courses and outside of them. Um, there are several science clubs on campus, such as Biosphere, Seminist, Skeptical Chemists. Um, I'm currently the secretary of Seminists and Skeptical Chemists, and we do a lot of fun activities that help students get to know each other while having some science themed fun. There's a ton to get involved in and so many opportunities as a STEM student, and I'm very happy with where I ended up. I'm planning on applying to PhD programs in the fall, and I uh, really feel like, Get like Gettysburg and the chemistry and biology departments in particular have prepared me well for my future. Uh, I will now be passing this off to Danielle, who is going to speak about her experiences as a double major in chemistry and physics. Hi guys, I'm Danielle. Um, I am a junior physics and chemistry double major. And I actually came to Gettysburg at first, just <laughs> I wanted to major in one and minor in the other, but I ended up liking both so much. I just majored in both. So that was nice. But um, I'm also a PLA and TA for the physics department. Um, PLA is a peer learning associate. So it's kind of like a tutor for intro classes and a TA is a teaching assistant. So like I grade and stuff for um, physics classes too. I also write for the Gettysburgian, uh, which is our campus uh, newspaper. And I host a radio show here on campus, WZBT. <laughs> and um, I have participated in EXIG as well with Dr. Sato, I've done research um, for the physics department. You can actually see Dr. Sato in the picture I have down there on the left side. Um, I've been involved with his research for about a year now. Uh, so right <laughs> in the midst of the pandemic, but thankfully our research is all computer based because um, we rely on computer cluster simulations uh, to analyze, to get our data. And we actually managed to publish a paper this summer, which was really cool. But um, anyway, with Dr. Sato, uh, I'm researching the movement of charge or electrons through uh, the Photosystem II Reaction Center, which you can see on the right side here. Um, and this is found in a lot of photosynthetic proteins, like the one on the left that looks like a bunch of colorful spaghetti. <laughs> and um, this photosystem is a really vital component of photosynthesis. It is the initial charge separation to separate water into hydrogen and oxygen. So that's used later on in other photosynthetic processes. And um, we're just concentrating on the reaction center here on the, on the right side. Um, and you can see right away, it's very symmetrical in its structure, but actually functionally, it's very asymmetrical and people don't really know why. Um, and so we decided to tackle this problem with our supercomputer and um, we use computer simulations to develop a charge transfer mechanism within this reaction center and uh, to see why it's so asymmetrical. And then these are just a few examples of some graphs that the computer gave us. Um, the top left picture is just kind of how we modeled the reaction center. Each colored circle is a group in the reaction center and the lines connecting all of them show how attracted they are to each other. And then the top right graph shows the um, charge efficiency. So where the charge transfer would be most efficient. Um, and basically, um, where the peaks of the two different states cross each other is where it's most efficient. So if you look really closely, you can see that the 1, 3, and the 1, 5 states are the most efficient that we're looking at here. And then this big graph down um, on the bottom left is just a huge matrix showing all the levels of attraction between all these transfer states because in order to have a successful charge transfer, we need them to be really attracted 
to one another and also to be very efficient. So we can go in here also looking really closely. Um, we find our one three state and our one five state. And we see that they are actually strongly attracted to each other. So that's good. Um, so we have a possible kind of pathway for our charge. And uh, just to double, triple check that, um, we made a population model to make sure that the charge is actually present in these states. And um, we see that the one three state actually, um, you might have to look in the smaller graph in there, the zoomed in part, the one three state is actually excited um, and has lots of charge population before the one five state gains that charge. So we can kind of tell that the charge is moving from the one three to the one five state. So we kind of just through all these graphs and computer power, get an idea of how the charge behaves in this reaction center, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what I did over the summer, this past summer in Exig. And it was really great getting to know Dr. Sato. I'm now actually TAing for him. So I definitely got you know, a great experience and a connection with Dr. Sato, which is really valuable. Um, and I'm gonna turn it to our BMB major, <laughs> Lee Magnus. Um, hi everyone, my name is Lee and I am a BMB major and an English minor. And I decided to come to Gettysburg, not only because I heard of all the great science programs and the research opportunities, but I was also super interested in the conservatory. So I was with the Gettysburg Bullets marching band for two seasons. I was the flute section leader for the second. And I also played cello in the orchestra. So I have a lot of fun bouncing back and forth between sciences and music. Um, I've also been fortunate to have a few jobs on campus. So I've worked on three prep crews twice for microbiology classes and once for the genetics class. And this is basically where it's a team of students who prepare materials for those classes, such as pouring plates or sterilizing equipment. And then I've also been a PLA, which is a peer learning, learning associate. And I've done that for introductory biology and you can host um, weekly review sessions and answer student questions. It's always fun. I'm currently on the pre-med track. I am interviewing with the medical committee at Gettysburg or pre-medical -pre committee at Gettysburg this year, so we'll see how that goes. And I have been doing research with Professor De La Salle since summer 2019, so it's going on two years now. And in her lab, we study bacteriophages, which are viruses that eat, that, that viruses that eat bacteria. And this is super interesting to research because they can potentially be an alternative to antibiotics. But this technology is a long ways off because it is a fairly new field within biology. And bacteriophages are the most abundant organism in the biosphere. And there's estimated to be 10 to the 31st phages in the world, which is an insane number to fathom, but this is basically more than any other organism on earth combined, including other bacteria. And so since they are a virus, they are technically not considered alive. So they need another organ organism to reproduce. So that's why they use the bacteria. And you can see in the top left image that the bacteriophage, the kind of alien looking, spider thing attaching to the bacterial cell and injecting its DNA. And once, in the, once the DNA is injected into the bacteria, it hijacks the cell's machinery to replicate the phage DNA and make its own proteins. And so in the bottom left, you can see a transmission micrograph, electron micrograph picture. So this is a super powerful uh, microscope to take a picture of the phages, which are kind of little circle things at the top attaching and attacking to the um, bacterial cell. But when we're in lab, we can't often see that small. So instead we plate them. And so on the right, you can see four different plates. And so you have these auger plates in which you put a bacterial lawn. And when you have the bacterial lawn on it, it creates that opaque kind of yellow color. And then you plate the phage on top of it. And since the phage eats the bacteria, once it is eaten, it forms a clear spot, so a clear spot, which we call a plaque. And so you can see in the top right image that that's a fairly low concentration phage plate because it's still mostly opaque, so it's mostly bacteria still. But on the two left images, you can see that they have got, become a little bit webbier, which means that there's a higher concentration of phage eating through the bacteria. So in summer 2019, we performed what we called a passaging experiment, and the goal of this apologies for the noises, we performed a passaging experiment. And the goal of this was to determine how many mutations, if any, would appear in a phage genome over a course of a seven week evolution experiment. And so we put 60 plus flasks in a shaking incubator pictured up top, which basically held these little flasks full of 
broth and bacteria and phage and they shake shook constantly to grow the phage and bacteria and we would we tested nine different phage bacteria combinations and every other day we would move the phage we would filter it from the old flask into a new flask and then put it back in the incubator to let it keep shaking keep evolving keep doing its thing and every four days we would make square plates which you can see along the bottom in order to check what's happening in the flasks is there phage still there is there bacteria still there what's going on because we can't see it ourselves and so these are serial dilutions so this basically just tells us the concentration of the phage and bacteria in each flask so each column is a different serial dilution so we would dilute the phage by 10 a magnitude of 10 and so the further out the row extends to the left, the more concentrated the phage was in the flask. So we got our results and they're a little inconclusive at the moment, but we're very excited to analyze our results this summer. We're gonna go back and check some stored samples we have, see what happened. And then in summer 2020, due to the pandemic, we were unable to do research in person, but we were able to do a lot of bioinformatic analysis. And we basically just used a bunch of computer programs to compare different phage genomes and check out what protein functions are in what phages to determine what's necessary for a phage. And I guess to you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should we turn off the slideshow maybe? Or, thank you. <laughs> Here's who we all are again. Um, well, thank you, Dio. You know, if, if we were in person, I would give all, a round of applause to the students. I think you guys did a great job, as did you, Professor Fry. Um, but thank you, thank you all. Um, please do, everyone who's in attendance, if you want to ask questions, put them in the Q&A. We've gotten a couple, um, and I'll, I'll be moderating this. I'll take the first question, which the first question was, is it possible to do research or take classes that combine sort of physical sciences and social sciences um, or does most interdisciplinary research stay within the, the natural sciences? And my answer is that yes, it absolutely is possible. And I think that's an area where we're seeing more and more growth. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have this new data science minor um, and that has come with a few faculty who are getting students involved in data science types of research where they're really doing, you know, looking at data sets that are coming about in various ways from the social sciences. Um, and analyzing them if, if using math and computer science, if that's what we mean. Um, there's other research projects. Um, we had one, one of our math professors, one of my colleagues in the math department, worked with some uh, students looking at math, the mathematics of voting and gerrymandering in particular, right? How congressional districts are drawn up. Um, and so students, you know, she had a student who she worked with on that project that was quite, um, yeah, that was quite interesting. Um, and then, as I mentioned, also, we, we have a lot of people who are doing public health or epidemiology types of work. And those are often, you know, sometimes involved with student research, sometimes through XSIG, sometimes outside of XSIG and in other programs. Um, but so this is happening. And certainly, I think there's interest among both the faculty and students. We, for a variety of reasons, we decided to sort of keep this panel about sort of more lab science research. Um, but if you have other questions about that, please ask um, that. Um, Professor Fry, why don't you take this next question, which is about how much, how does the, what percent of the research goes to academic credits? How does our doing this research interact with getting credit? Yeah, so in terms of getting academic cre credit, I think it's it's kind of dependent upon when you're starting to do research and in what department you're doing it. So I'll answer kind of for chemistry, and then I can say a little bit about how it's different. So there's kind of three flavors of research. There is the summer research program that we talked about. There is academic year research where you would take it for a course. And then there's also um, kind of a more uh, internship version of it. So in terms of doing it during the summer, this is the eight weeks full time, um, we actually in chemistry do count that as a class. It ends up being a 465, right, just in terms of its number, but some uh, students do get course credit for that. 
during the academic year, um, you get a course credit for it if you are doing what's called a Chem 460 or 461, and that is considered 10 hours of research. So we consider that like a full-time load for that of a class. Um, but the one that I'm actually most excited about um, is what we call a 290 course. And these are common across um, many of the departments within our division. And these are called research, um, they're mentored research internships. And so these are quarter credit classes, which are 40 hours for the entire semester. So if you do a quick back of the envelope calculation, that's an afternoon a week. And so it's kind of a perfect way when you're a first year a sophomore to kind of get your toe in the water, right? To kind of figure out whether or not research is something that you're interested in. Um, in many cases, I think right now I actually have four people doing 290s in my lab. Um, and so it's enough to kind of keep a project going if you're already working in a lab or to actually get some experience. And so um, it's about learning how to use instrumentation. It's about being um, mentored by other students in the lab. And so like I pointed out, that's a quarter credit. Um, so it shows up on your transcript. So when you're applying for jobs or other internships, they can see you have that experience. Um, I do want to point out that it's different depending on different departments. In some cases, it's only credit for when you write your senior thesis and so on, but there's definitely different ways to get academic credit for doing research. And remember that during the summer, you're getting paid, which is a nice little feather to add to that experience. Yeah, yeah I would just add, I mean, I think, right, it does vary a lot from, from professor to professor and experience to experience. And we're sort of lumping a lot of things into this big umbrella of what we mean by research. And I think there's a number of departments that are doing more and more course-based research. In math, we have uh, several courses where students are doing research um, projects with a faculty member during the, you know, as a course. And I think biology is really embracing course-based course -based undergraduate research, even in their freshman biology classes, the first year biology classes. Um, and so it really does vary a lot, quite a bit. Um, maybe this next question, so you can put the questions in either the, in q and A is probably the best place to put it, um, one of the questions, though, that came in through the chat was about the relationship between capstones and XSIG. And I guess, I don't know, maybe I'll ask our student panelists, you know, if you have anything to say about this, about how you sort of think about a capstone research project that you might be looking to um, or versus the XSIG and if there's a relationship. Do any of you have any comments about this? Or Professor, well, Fry. Professor Yeah, Professor Fry, tell me if I say anything wrong, but <laughs> um, they actually, they can interlink. And so um, a lot of classes, once you reach like the 300 level, it will specify that it is a capstone course. And so basically that means there's gonna be some form of an independent research project part of it. So Jordan and I are currently taking biochemistry two, and that is a capstone course. And so basically in lab, we are researching our own individual section of a larger experiment and so that counts as our capstone but you can also take your exit research and do i know in biology it's a bio 460 i don't know if the number's same for chemistry or other departments but you can take your summer research and turn it into a capstone project she said everything correctly yeah so in, in terms of it we have worked capstones into our majors so it's not required that one does research like independent research through exig that we're talking about in order to fulfill a capstone and in fact many of our students if they're doing for instance the bmb major probably do at least three capstones before they graduate based on their courses and their research so they're definitely interrelated and many exig experiences can be turned into capstones is how i would describe it exactly and I think that's true, right, in most of the science departments that I can think of. I think there's some, some minor variation on what Lee said is true, I think, in all the sciences. We have a question here about the first year seminars and which ones we think best complement the lab science or health sciences major. And I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll answer just quickly to say I think the answer is any of them can, right? And I think there's some, you know, I mentioned earlier some of the sciencey ones that we're offering this year um, that might be ap particularly appealing to science students. On the other hand, I also think, you know, this coming to Gettysburg is a liberal arts college experience. And sometimes by complement, you want to do something totally different. If you're going to be taking bio and chem in your first semester here, you might want your first year seminar to be about French literature or, you know, one of the other ones. Um, so that, that's sort of my answer as a former director of the program, but here I really want to ask our students, you know, 
Did you take first year seminars? What were they? What did you think? And how would you answer? What do you think about this question? So I would actually, I think, recommend, especially if you are a STEM student, to take something that isn't necessarily STEM related, um, because coming in as a B&B major uh, in particular, you're coming in, you're taking intro chem, intro bio, and in my first semester, I also took calculus to try to uh, finish like the math requirement of uh, my major. So with those three like STEM classes, it was really nice for me to have a fourth class that was not STEM at all. Um, and like, I know you're excited about getting in and jumping straight in, but it can be really nice to have something that is totally different. Um, my first year seminar was called uh, Beauty, Bodies and Blessings. Uh, it was taught by the chaplain at the time and it was about um, how different religions perceive bodies. And it was really interesting because I got to meet a lot of people who I otherwise wouldn't have met. Um, there were several people from several different perspective majors in that class. And I really got to know some people who I wouldn't have met if I would have stuck to a more STEM focused uh, first year seminar. Um, so I would encourage you to shop around for them and not just look at the STEM ones, but certainly if you're interested in that, go for it as well, but just keep your options open. Lee or Danielle, do you, which, what seminars did you take? <laughs> I took a philosophy based first year seminar. So, you know, kind of the same thing Jordan was talking about. I wanted to break from science because I was taking chemistry, calculus, and physics <laughs> my first semester. So it was nice to have a break. And it was really cool too. It, um, it really teaches, like it shows you different perspectives, which I think is really valuable. So I definitely recommend exactly what Jordan said. I've been trying to think of the name of my first year seminar and I honestly can't remember, <laughs> but I think it was something like food, water, shelter, song. It was basically, it was an environmental science focused class, but it was taught by an English professor actually, Professor Lane. And it was really interesting because it was just examining um, climate change through all different lenses. And I really enjoyed it because it was a more science material class, but the way we approached it was very, very different than any other class I've had. So for example, my final project, I played uh, somewhere over the rainbow with a friend on cello we did cello duet so that is unlike any other stem class I've taken so it's really I really like them just because they push you so far out of your comfort zone and you really do need that in order to um, I don't know just find new opportunities thanks no and I would agree I mean I think a lot of them are sort of science adjacent without being science courses, such as that one, or I mentioned the philosophy of Einstein in Wonderland, quantum, philosophy of quantum physics one. Um, and I think those can be good if they sort of, sort of scratch a science itch while also being a very different, using a very different part of your brain because that is, I think, important. Uh, there's a quick question here about, are they all writing courses? No, um, many of them satisfy the first year writing requirement. Many of them don't. Um, there's other ways to satisfy that first year writing requirement. Um, and, you know, my strong recommendation, well, part of my recommendation is if you, I believe Sunday night is the panel for that they're doing one of these for about first year seminars explicitly. And you can see some of our amazing colleagues talking about those. Um, but mostly look through the list, see what's interesting to you, rank a few that are interesting to you. Um, and that's what I would really recommend thinking about. Um, there's a question here, Professor Fry, about how students would start the process of engaging in research in general and ex-sig specifically. I don't know if you want to say a few words and then maybe some of the one or two of the students can take it. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, it's funny because I, I get this question a lot as the coordinator of ExSIG, you know, people send me emails and so on. And I would actually say that engaging with your professors is, is quite literally the best thing to do. So the professors that you have in your first year talking to them, coming to information sessions about majors and things like that, and just reaching out to faculty. So I, I've had students who I've never actually met before who sent me kind of cold, you know, cold call email saying, oh, Professor Fry, I heard about the type of research that you do and can we have a meeting and so on. So I think what I would suggest if you're, you know right away that this is something that you're interested in is just contact. It's really, I always say that I, and I, and I mean this, I pick my research students based on the sparkle of the, in their eye. It's like the interest, it's the passion more than anything else. And if I can see that passion early when they've reached out to me, I think that's really key. And so I, I, I in fact, I, I, 
in terms of I, when I took Jordan, right? That, that's one of the reasons where that came from. Do any of the students want to very quickly in 30 seconds or less say, how did you match up with your research people? Advisors, the X -SIG, like program when you're getting in, when you're applying to X -SIG, uh, really facilitates that because as part of the application process, you meet with about three professors and just have like meet, uh, meetings with them to discuss their research and have a conversation with them. And that really facilitates those connections as well. And that usually happens February or March um, in the spring. So that is a way to very quickly get into research. I think I, I will just conclude by saying, right, um, before I hand it back over to, to Dean Sweezy, that I think one of the great things about Gettysburg is that you can really get to know your faculty, right, through all of these ways that we're talking about. Um, and I think it's, it might sound intimidating to you to sort of how, how would you figure out who the faculty member is to work with. But once you start, you know, both in your classes through formal sessions like Professor Fry was mentioning, or just in the hallways and who you run into in, you know, in the lounges of departments, you really can get to know your faculty. And I think that is a really good way to learn about research mentors. And it's just a good thing to do. And one of the nice things about being at a place like Gettysburg. So that would be my other answer. Gail, do you wanna, do you have other final parting thoughts? Yes, if I were here, if we were in person, I would give you all a standing ovation. Thank you so, so much for giving such great information to our accepted students. Um, and thank you, students, accepted students, class of 2025, for your terrific questions. If we didn't get to all of them, we will reach out to you individually. Um, but thank you so much. And if you continue to have questions about Gettysburg College, um, please reach out to me directly. Um, and I will be glad to connect you. And everybody here on the panel, of course, is available to answer your questions as well. So thank you so much and have a really great evening. <laughs>